Good morning, MCC. Today we welcome a very special guest. History will judge our guest as an outstanding Secretary of State and a true champion for development. But for many around the world today, me included, she is a great role model. So today we are very blessed to have her presence with us today. Madam Secretary, let me briefly tell you what has been accomplished under your tenure as the chair of our board by the professional men and women that work at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We have grown our com compact portfolio to $9.1 billion. We estimate that our programs will benefit approximately 175 million people and raise incomes by over $12 billion. Under your watch, we've signed eight new compacts. We have successfully completed nine compacts. We have terminated one compact for bad behavior, and we have reinstated one compact for good behavior. We are helping our partners to help them become more food secure, energy secure, water secure. We are building the infrastructures of our partner countries to make sure that they're very competitive in the global market. And, of course, we are reforming their policies to make sure that the investments that have been made by the American taxpayers are sustained for a very long time and to create an environment where aid will no longer be needed. Under your leadership, Madam Secretary, MCC has made incredible contributions to the President's new global development policy, Food Feed the Future, Partnership for Growth, and Gender Integration. We're also providing lessons learned from our impact evaluation processes to other USG organizations as well as to the entire global development community about what's working, what's not working, how we could do development better. We deeply appreciate and value your tremendous support of MCC. To the MCC family, please join me in welcoming my mentor, my great hero, my children's great hero and role model, and to the millions around the world, a champion of democracy, freedom, and prosperity, the chair of our board of directors, our Secretary of State, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here and to have this opportunity uh, to tell you in person uh, how much I value the work that you do every day. I'm aware that it's not only those of you in this room uh, that uh, are part of this event today, but also uh, by video conference and those who are uh, calling in from around the world. Uh, and my first and most important message is uh, how proud I am of you and how grateful I am for uh, what you are doing, which truly has made the differences that uh, Daniel uh, has just uh, briefly outlined. Uh, for the past four years, and then before that as a senator, I've had the privilege of supporting MCC uh, and seeing the impact of the work that you do on the ground. Uh, I've joined uh, your CEO uh, in uh, several occasions signing uh, new compacts and have certainly seen the impact uh, that that has had on the uh, way that governments have prepared and organized themselves in order to be successful. Uh, so today we are uh, welcomed in 35 countries. Uh, people around the world are eager to partner with MCC and uh, even willing to try to meet the standards that uh, have been devised. Uh, for such a partnership. Uh, and that speaks volumes about the work that all of you uh, and your predecessors uh, have done 
to establish a, a new approach to development as part of America's uh, foreign policy agenda. I remember uh, last year Daniel and I were in Tanzania uh, standing in front of what looked like, because it was, uh, a huge jet engine and getting ready to uh, symbolically throw the switch on a new power plant that would provide reliable electricity for thousands of nearby homes, businesses, and hospitals. Uh, I remember thinking about what a wonderful metaphor uh, that was because we truly were turning on opportunity, uh, turning on the chance that uh, would be given to people to uh, be able to make more of uh, their own lives, helping Tanzanians tap into uh, their own power so their country could uh, grow and prosper. And that's really true with what you do everywhere. Uh, I've seen the uh, solar uh, projects uh, in El Salvador that are helping to light uh, small homes and provide um, a connectivity to the outside world that had not been uh, there before. I've uh, supported strongly the uh, cause of uh, helping Jordan uh, conserve and recycle water for uh, use, finding ways to uh, spur green growth in Indonesia, and so much more. Now, in addition to what you've done around the world, you've also had a big impact uh, here at home. Uh, MCC's model showcases some of our best thinking about how to do development for the 21st century and has helped to set the stage for the administration's approach for development uh, because at a time when we must look for the way to maximize the impact of every dollar that uh, we spend on development, uh, we often turn to MCC for information and inspiration. Uh, as Daniel said, uh, in this administration under President Obama, we've tried to put forth a, a new policy on development that really focuses on results. Uh, and uh, MCC has been uh, one of the foundational uh, institutions that has given us uh, the base for moving forward. We are working to put ourselves out of business, uh, to hasten the day when countries no longer need foreign assistance. So we are pursuing country-owned efforts that are led, implemented, and eventually paid for uh, by a nation's own government, communities, civil society, and private sector. That's really the path that MCC has helped to blaze. Uh, because you work directly with governments to identify development priorities and to uh, design country-specific plans that are backed by hard data. Uh, you put a focus on building local capacity and rewarding good governance an approach that we are building on in all of our development work, including major programs uh, like the Global Health Initiative and uh, Feed the Future. Uh, for me, this is a real mission because uh, uh, we understand uh, completely that uh, uh, we have to demonstrate unequivocally that uh, uh, the United States is willing to help those who are willing to help themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, overlook or back away from our pure humanitarian assistance, something that USAID is a real leader in and must continue to provide. Uh, but we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and not getting better results. Uh, and because of the standards that you've set and the accountability and evaluations that you have imposed upon yourself, we are beginning to get a better idea of what works and what doesn't work. Now that is not always popular and it's not always easy uh, because we're all human. People get used to doing things a certain way and they can, on an anecdotal level, see results that reinforce uh, the patterns that they've engaged in. But we can no longer afford to do development like that. We have to have better data, harder analysis, more accountability, both for us but also for the countries and people uh, with whom we work. Uh, we look to MCC for helping to uh, uh, bring about that strategic shift that we're making in our development work from aid to investment um, and looking at the risk-reward uh, calculation, uh, literally uh, expecting to be able better to calculate a rate of return. 
Uh, now, sometimes that does mean uh, suspending and even terminating contracts when host governments are not living up to their end of the agreement, as uh, you did uh, in Mali and uh, briefly in Malawi. Uh, those are hard choices to make. But I think they have uh, a positive effect. You know, just speaking about uh, Malawi, for example, um, we, were, we were able to get the attention of the uh, previous government uh, and make a strong case to the incoming government uh, that uh, the MCC, which had been uh, working in Malawi, would disappear, that we could not continue it if democracy uh, was not uh, maintained, if uh, the rule of law did not uh, stand um, firm in uh, making the transition from the president who uh, passed away to the vice president. And I often use uh, you uh, shamelessly uh, as I'm engaging with, you know, presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, and others um, about what we can do for them if they're willing to do things for themselves. Um, and I think uh, we're employing some of these same ideas and strategies in the Partnership for Growth uh, countries. Now, we're looking ahead to the next step of our development agenda. We need to build a broader network of partners at the local level and national levels. And we're looking at uh, MCC's competitive procurement uh, processes, uh, your work with local management companies. Uh, and other lessons that we can uh, learn. It's important that as we talk about country-led and country-owned, we put real meat on the bones. Uh, I spoke at length about this uh, at the uh, International Development Conference in Busan, uh, South Korea, uh, earlier this year, uh, because it can just be a slogan, in which case nothing really changes. Uh, it can be an excuse for setting countries up for failure, uh, to be able to say, we told you so. Um, or it can be uh, a, a difficult but rewarding uh, path forward. Obviously, we hope it's the latter. Uh, but there are things countries have to do for themselves. Uh, and as Daniel and some of you know, um, collecting taxes, you know, having your own revenues, making your elites. Uh, actually pay for schools and health and infrastructure, things that are just uh, beyond the pale in some countries that uh, have no uh, ability or willingness uh, to try to do so. Uh, looking at uh, transparency and using electronic uh, technology to uh, bring about transparency, whether countries want it or not. Uh, having a real firm grip on what can be done to uh, stamp out corruption. Uh, and this has to be not only our mission uh, in the United States with our various uh, institutions, MCC, USAID, state, DOD, all of us, uh, but it needs to be globally enforced. Uh, and we're beginning to see some movement in that direction as well. So when I came in, I said I wanted to elevate uh, de development and diplomacy uh, to uh, be on a par with defense, that we needed to start thinking of the so-called three Ds as part of our smart power uh, framework for foreign policy and national security. Uh, and I, I really believe we've gone a long way uh, toward achieving that. Uh, and we need to continue. We can't rest. We have to keep making reforms. We have to ask hard questions. We have to be unafraid uh, to expose our own shortcomings and the problems that we have. Uh, some people worry about that, that, you know, that will mean that the Congress or the American public won't support us. I actually think it's contrary. I think greater transparency internally and externally gives us a stronger platform to build on for the programs that we think are worth investing in. And MCC is certainly uh, at the top of the line there. So this is a high priority uh, for me personally. It certainly is as Secretary of State and as Chair Honorary or whatever I am uh, for uh, the uh, MCC Board. Uh, the model of the Board is something that I highly value, having outside uh, independent private uh, uh, representatives. All of what you're trying to do uh, really has pushed our development agenda. So I hope that uh, you will continue uh, to set a high standard to produce results 
uh, to do tough uh, evaluations, uh, finding out what works and what doesn't work, what's worth funding and not worth funding, uh, and continue to give me and uh, my successor, whoever that might be, a good talking point. Uh, when I say, you know, you won't be eligible for an MCC compact if you don't do this, it actually does open eyes and get attention. Uh, so we will continue to uh, do that so long as you continue to give us a good story to tell, and I'm confident that you will. Thank you all very much. So, Daniel, I'm willing to take a few questions. Sure. All right. So, uh, we have a question. Linda. I mean, Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank oh, you Wellesley. <laughs> oh, Wellesley. A shameless Wait pander that I fully appreciate. <laughs> Thanks for being here and for your support for MCC. I'm just wondering, over your past four years of experience, as you look into the next administration, what do you think our administration's priorities sh for development should be? Well, I think they um, should be continuing and accelerating a lot of the reforms that we're already undertaking uh, and enhancing even more the rigorous analysis that needs to go along with any of these reforms. I really still believe we have to do a better job uh, integrating and coordinating what we do across our government because it is uh, not possible to replicate and duplicate everything that somebody else is doing. Uh, one of our goals has been to try to bring all of our development efforts uh, in countries uh, together so that we know what's happening. I mean, I will just tell you as a first lady and as a senator, um, when I would travel, as I did widely, um, I would often find, uh, and this was pre-MCC days as well as uh, post-MCC days, uh, that somebody would be there on a USAID project or a CDC project or a DOL project, and they would never even talk to each other. They would rarely be in the same room. And so the countries we were working with were understandably somewhat confused. I mean, who do we talk to? Who's more important than somebody else? Well, everybody's doing something which we think is important, or hopefully we would not be there. But if we don't better coordinate and integrate uh, what we're doing, we won't get the biggest impact. So that if MCC is building a road, uh, it might make sense for you know, USAID to fund a hospital that will be accessible by the road just saying, uh, that kind of thing <laughs> makes sense to me, um, or for PEPFAR to be closely coordinating with CDC and uh, USAID on the delivery of uh, health systems reform because it's all part of the same government, the same taxpayers, and hopefully uh, to reach the same results. So I, I think we've made a start, but it's hard. I'm not going to stand up here and, and tell you it isn't. It is hard because Different organizations have different cultures, different uh, uh, jurisdictions uh, in the Congress. You've got different committees, so nobody wants, you know, to be shorted in their committee by giving any uh, benefit to another committee that oversees a different organization in the government. So it's a little maddening, but we've been working very hard to try to uh, move forward. I think also. Um, being sure that we have uh, more insight into uh, cost savings that are achievable. Um, you know, it won't surprise you to hear that I am, you know, pretty obsessed with procurement reform uh, here at MCC, at USAID, and elsewhere. I mean, it makes no sense that we'd be in a country and you'd have one group buying furniture separate from another group or vehicles when we should be getting cost benefits and, you know, scales of economy that, I mean, it's the Ameri ultimately it's all the American taxpayer dollar, so we should be smarter about how we do procurement and we should be smarter about our overall platforms. Uh, we have, you know, the foreign aid um, website where we're trying to be really transparent about all of this. Um, so 
We've got a good start, but we have a long way to go uh, in order to be able to uh, be as effective and accountable with every dollar that we spend in development. And I do think we have to keep pushing our multilateral partners, both governments and NGOs, to be on the same page as we are, because then we'll get more uh, bang for our mutual uh, investments. Uh, and finally, I guess I would say that uh, there are certain uh, expectations that everybody in our government should have from the governments that they deal with. So it can't be just MCC saying corruption, corruption, corruption is a big problem. Everybody needs to say that. And we need to be creative and smart about how we convey that uh, effectively. So I'm excited. I think that we could, in the next four years, uh, really institutionalize a lot of the changes uh, that we've been undertaking. Uh, and be a, a real global leader in how we deliver uh, aid and how we further investment. And MCC should be right at the, you know, front line of that. with Congressional and Public Affairs. Mm -hmm. Welcome to MCC. Um, you as a uh, First Lady, Senator, and now Secretary of State, you have met some amazing people during your many years of public service, people that my son and all our children will read about in history books. Of all the people you've met, who's the one person who you simply cannot forget and why? Wow. <laughs> Not Americans, right? <laughs> Uh, Nelson Mandela. Yeah, Nelson Mandela. I mean, and, and for me, it was highly personal as well as uh, um, what he's done on the, on the public stage. Um, you know, like so many people around the world, I, you know, was uh, active uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, I was, you know, very much in favor of uh, disinvestment and worked in organizations that uh, promoted uh, disinvestment and uh, watched when uh, Mandela uh, walked out of uh, jail uh, and then followed closely everything that happened uh, after that. Um, but the great privilege of my life was getting to know him. And um, I went to his inauguration as part of our um, official delegation uh, led by Vice President Gore and myself. Uh, and it was an incredible experience because we had breakfast uh, in the morning at the President's house with de Klerk and the outgoing uh, Afrikaner government. Then we went to the inauguration and then we came back to the President's house for the inaugural lunch uh, with the new President. So it was just this, uh, you know, eight-hour period uh, where the, the real change that everybody had worked for and voted for actually occurred. And in that, um, in that uh, lunch, which was filled with all kinds of people who were um, there both because they represented countries or because they had supported uh, the ANC in its uh, struggle, uh, so, you know, you had Fidel Castro and Yasser Arafat and uh, Al Gore. I mean, it was, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, one of my jobs was to stay away from Fidel Castro, which was, you know, which is what I spent my time doing, circling around the room before we sat down for lunch. Uh, but so we were at this lunch, and, um, and Mandela had given a, a, an extraordinary um, inaugural speech and was one of the very first uh, national leaders to mention the importance of equality for women, which I liked to hear. Uh, but he stood up at the lunch and he greeted all of these dignitaries, some of whom he had known before he went into prison, but most of whom had come to uh, prominence during the 27 years he was in prison. And uh, he said he was so honored to have all these very distinguished people from around the world. But the three most important people to him at the lunch were three of his former jailers. And he pointed to these three white men and asked them to stand. And he said, um, there were many people who uh, were 
in charge of us on Robben Island during the time that I was <coughs> imprisoned. Uh, but these three men um, treated me with dignity. And I will never forget that. And I wanted them to be here. And sitting there listening uh, to that and, and knowing how easy it is when you are in public life, let alone someone who's a leader of a movement who loses the most productive years of his life to being in a very small cell, which I have visited twice, um, and the level of self-awareness and forgiveness and humanity and compassion and smartness uh, that that represented was just breathtaking to me. And in the years, you know, since then, I've spent a lot of time with him. Um, I went back and went to his prison cell with him. I went back another time with my husband and went to his prison cell. Um, and, you know, if you saw the movie uh, Invictus about how he adopted the South African rugby team, which had historically been an all-white kind of, you know, symbol of uh, uh, white South Africa, and how he cheered them on and, and demonstrated great uh, uh, sport uh, interest in them. Uh, his ability to put himself in someone else's shoes, and I asked him about it one time, and, and he said well, something that he has said in public, he said, I, you know, when I went into prison, I was a very angry young man. And I realized that I could not stay angry and survive as a whole person. And when I walked out of prison, I knew that if I didn't forgive those who had imprisoned me, I'd still be imprisoned. And it was just so wise and so extraordinarily important for the world to hear. I, I visited him uh, last summer where he now lives with his wonderful wife, uh, Gracia Michelle. And, you know, that smile is incandescent. Uh, and even though he's, you know, over 90 and not in great health, uh, he still just conveys such a sense of authority and presence. Uh, so I've met a lot of really extraordinary people. I've been very fortunate uh, to do that over the course of my life. but. If I have to pick only one, um, for all the reasons that are well known publicly and all the lessons that I learned from him personally, uh, it would be Nelson Mandela. It's an excellent question, and it's one that we uh, think about a lot because there's no doubt that uh, newsflash, global warming is real, and uh, <laughs> that it's having an impact around the world, particularly um, in places where mitigation and uh, remediation are very expensive and hard to do, but it's also going to have an impact everywhere. So the longer we postpone the inevitable, the higher the price, the greater the cost uh, to all of us. So I think um, what, we're, you know, what we're trying to do here in the United States is to uh, make progress in our own efforts, whether it's higher gas mileage for cars or higher standards for power plants, um, energy uh, more energy efficiency, more alternative energy. But what we've been uh, really struggling with is how to persuade the fast-growing economies that they need to do things like that as well. It's very difficult to say to a Chinese or Indian person, oh, by the way, uh, you shouldn't buy that car. Uh, you shouldn't buy air, an air conditioner. Um, because that'll hurt the climate and will eventually hurt you. And, you know, this person's thinking, you know, my parents were totally impoverished. They had nothing. They gave me an education. I'm making a good living. And, yeah, I want to buy a car. And 
I'd like to have air conditioning. So part of the challenge is if we can get the technology to outpace uh, the rapid increase in uh, global income in a lot of the emerging uh, countries so that we have a fighting chance to get ahead of the uh, climate change curve, which is going in the wrong direction, as you know. That's part of what we do with diplomacy. Um, part of what we do um, with development is look for ways that we can help mitigate. You know, the compact that I mentioned in, in Indonesia, which has a lot of uh, potential, but we'll see how it plays out. Uh, making uh, common cause with countries that are facing uh, very difficult uh, conditions if they don't themselves try to uh, be part of a, a global community response. But I, you know, I think we're, I, I think we are really facing serious consequences because of our inability to try to get the world together uh, to act more quickly. Uh, and I know this is a, a priority for the President. I know that he's going to really focus on what more can be done um, that may not require congressional action because I'm not sure we can get the kind of action we would want um, out of the Congress. And then try to build up uh, the multilateral approach as much as we can. Now, partly out of um, frustration that we weren't moving quickly enough on the UN track, although some positive developments came out of uh, Cancun and, and Durban. You know, they're meeting in Doha right now. We formed something out of the State Department called the uh, Clean Air and Climate Coalition to deal with the short-term uh, climate forcers, um, the pollutants like methane, uh, like uh, soot, uh, because carbon dioxide is the major but not the only uh, contributor to what we are confronting with climate change. And in fact, if we can do something about these uh, other uh, uh, pollutants, we can deal with up to 40 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. So we started this group with a small handful of um, countries. We've expanded it. We're working very hard on specific deliverables. I also helped to form something called uh, the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which is the contributor to black soot, black carbon, uh, in order to try to get cleaner um, cookstoves that could uh, diminish the impact. So we're, we're moving on a bunch of different fronts, and it's both diplomacy and development. Uh, but everyone knows we're not moving fast enough, uh, and one of our, our real problems is what we can do to lead and assume responsibility, but also what we can do to get others who, understandably, are a little bit um, less than enthusiastic if they think it's going to undermine their development, and we still haven't made an effective enough argument about why uh, there's a alternative path to development, uh, because it still is more costly uh, to do alternative energy in lots of places. Uh, so we're, we're working on all of this simultaneously, but it's, it's a, I was in, I went to the um, Pacific Islands Forum in Cook Islands this past uh, summer, and those little islands may disappear. They may just absolutely disappear. And you'll have to have a lot of uh, relocation of people, uh, which will be very disruptive. So there are human consequences as well as economic consequences and health consequences uh, that are going to have to be dealt with. The final thing I would say is the Arctic, you know, we're, we're about to see the first oil tanker go through the Arctic uh, because there is no ice to stop it. So we're working through something called the Arctic Council to try to get ahead of that, uh, to have a, uh, an oil spill uh, protocol that we would all deal with because it's not only the potential for drilling that could be catastrophic, but it's also uh, an accident waiting to happen with a tanker. So there's 
you look around the globe, this remains one of the most serious threats that all of humanity faces, and uh, we haven't, none of us has done enough to deal with it yet. I think we might have a question from the field. Kenny from Cape Verde. Me. Kenny. Good morning, Madam Secretary. My name is Kenny Miller. It's my honor to address you today for the beautiful nation of Cape Verde. Where as resident country director, I'm privileged to lead an exceptional team of MCC staff in partnership with the government of Cape Verde. MCC's pioneer second compact. It's a mix of national policy reform in the water sanitation sector and in land management. Question. Uh, is, as you know, MCC has worked very hard uh, to lead U.S. foreign assistance initiatives to promote economic growth alongside relatively high-performing partner countries. That said, what do you see for MCC's budgetary and operational future as much of the limited U.S. foreign assistance funds are directed at fighting terrorism, narcotics, disaster relief, supporting and transitioning democracy? I think the question was about the budget, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm sorry, Kenny, I, it, you were breaking up, so I, I apologize. We, we have this question here. Um, MCC has worked hard to lead our foreign assistance initiatives in promoting economic growth alongside our relatively high-performing country partners. That said, what do you see in our budgetary future as much of the U.S. foreign assistance funds are directed to fighting terrorism, narcotics, disaster relief, and supporting transitioning democracies? Well, I think that uh, the, the four points that uh, you just mentioned will continue to be a priority uh, for um, the Congress and the administration. Uh, but I also think MCC will continue to be a priority. And uh, part of the advantage that uh, MCC has is it's viewed as uh, a uh, bipartisan uh, uh, institution uh, started by uh, George Bush. Uh, I think that gives you a built-in level of uh, congressional support that has to be nurtured and tended all the time, but nevertheless is an important asset that MCC has. Uh, but we all know we're going into a difficult budget environment. Uh, nobody will get everything they want. They possibly they, they 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 just can't. That won't that is just not fiscally possible. Um, but I'm sure MCC will be uh, given uh, a, a very positive response uh, by the administration uh, and the Congress. And part of the challenge is to keep being able to do. Uh, as much as possible with the resources you have because you keep learning how to do it better. Uh, and that in itself is confidence building. So I, I think MCC's budget will be um, certainly uh, given uh, a positive hearing both uh, in the administration and the Congress. And the more MCC can be positioned uh, as a leading uh, development uh, agency around the world, and as one that has learned lessons that will hopefully benefit all uh, development agencies, I think the argument for uh, MCC's budget just gets stronger. One more question, Joan. Well, I'm in favor of all my programs. Uh, <laughs> and if I were in front of USAID or the State Department, I would be asked the same question. So I think, I think uh, look, um, the uh, negotiations going on over the lame duck are going to 
affect every program. And, and I can't, standing here, determine what is going to be considered proportionate or disproportionate. Um, obviously, we uh, in the State Department, uh, and I personally, you know, believe strongly that MCC is uh, an important program that has proven itself and has to be um, adequately funded in order to continue the good work and to have the disproportionate impact on development theory and practice that MCC is having. Uh, but, you know, let's be candid. I mean, if it's a choice between you know, Head Start or school lunch uh, and the 150 account, that's going to be a harder case to make. So we are doing everything we can uh, and will continue to to make the case that the 150 account is important for uh, our country and for our security and for the kind of world we want to live in and the uh, better governance that we find around the world, the greater transparency, the less corruption, uh, more accountability is good for the people in those countries, but it's also good uh, for the United States. Uh, so we have a very strong case to make, but, uh, you know, I've I've been on both sides of this, and it's, it's a very difficult uh, undertaking. So you keep doing your job, which is to uh, be the, uh, along with your colleagues, uh, the, the voices and reminders as to what we've already accomplished in a relatively short period of time uh, with MCC. Uh, and I'm certainly working to do everything I can to protect the 150 account, which is uh, you know, bigger than MCC, but which does uh, represent uh, our commitment to the kind of uh, world that we want uh, our children and grandchildren to grow up in. So um, we, we have no way to predict what's going to happen, what's going to be the final decisions on um, how the pie will be sliced and what will be cut off in order to meet the, the spending cuts that will have to be made uh, in order to reach a deal in the Congress. Um, it's going to be a very difficult negotiation, and I know that, uh, you know, the President and the White House are uh, doing everything they can to, to shape it in a way that reflects our values and our interests um, at home and, and around the world, and MCC will be a part of that. I think that's it. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Thank you for your support of MCC and the entire development community. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's give our sector a big round of applause, all right? Yeah,